breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to The Glitter Boys! Guys, I got a question for you. Hmm. Yeah, shoot. How do you make it so your glitter boy just doesn't keep firing the frickin' boom gun every damn action? <laughs> That's, I, I don't have an answer. I, I don't. I, I wish I did. But I'm curious reload to know speed. if you guys got any suggestions. To reload speed. Reload speed? Re- recoil, yeah. Well, they have the recoil I mean, compensator, so I can't go with that one. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, it takes time. That that keeps them from getting knocked off their feet. That's mm-hmm. just sticks in the ground. You know? Yeah. They got, and then bring themselves back upright. So, yeah, the the idea of convincing players who have very nice tricked out characters to actually do something other than just spam mm-hmm. most powerful attack. Like you have players with robots robots that might be bristling with weapons and they'll just like pick the most powerful one that every single turn yep it puzzles me how how to solve this because to me it is a problem it it makes for stale combat it it's boring may i recommend investing more heavily into palladium's fabulous system of books because no matter what you choose for your pc or the or your robot a couple books down the line, there will be something that can just wipe the floor mm-hmm. with it. <laughs> well, you see, that's taking an aggressive approach to it when it's not necessarily the thing to do. Where when a you know a player has a character that's too powerful, this is just isn't, trying to sell books here. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, but this isn't a this isn't a uh, problem of a character being too powerful. Mm-hmm. It's just a problem of a one trick pony. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and. Palladium has actually been one of the few game systems that have come up with some interesting solutions from time to time over the years with this. For instance, uh, Ninjas and Super Spies. If you're playing Ninjas and Super Spies without the melee combat range mechanics, I'm not going to say you're doing it wrong, but you are losing a huge opportunity for some of the most cinematic hong kong oh great your northern fist is stronger than my southern leg type (laughs) things well i'll just have to keep you at long range so your fist can't reach me uh the same thing can be done in dungeons and dragons because weapons reach was a thing in that system that there are little ways to do minor bits of it some systems like 7c actually had entire mechanics where you were heavily advantaged by doing something over the top, swinging on the chandelier, cross the room sort of thing, and you gained massive game bonuses for it. So there's that. With riffs, it gets a little bit harder because you're, often your counter is wipe the floor with the person. Um, because despite the fact they're running around in giant robots with multiple weapon systems, those weapon systems tend to be incredibly multi-purpose. You, you're, you have a rack of missiles, but your rack of missiles tend to be general purpose and aren't like heat seeking versus anti-radiation. Your railgun is a do all be all sort of thing that doesn't have a transverse speed and a lot of the other things that can naturally build into that. Yeah. Um, One option is the storytelling perspective where hitting it with your biggest thing is not necessarily the best option. For instance, my original counter to the glitter boy boom gun was if you're in a small village full of SDC buildings, exactly what is that shockwave going to do to all the people? (laughs) Yeah. I've always, uh, one of the things I always try and do is, is just what you said, is introduce the consequences of, of things. If you are standing in plain sight and just, you know, hitting your macro key, but with dice, what you, what should be happening is, okay, glitter boy, you are there. It is daylight. You are glittering in the sun. (laughs) You are clearly the most, you know, destructive force on this battlefield. The enemies 
have stopped shooting at everyone and decided to focus their fire on you. You're not in cover, you say. No, no concealment, you say. You, you, want, you want to encourage the thinking, the tactical thinking, whenever possible. It depends on how crunchy you want to make it later, because you don't want, you know, I know like NPC, you, you don't want to deal with things like, well, how, how deep is your concealment right now? You mm -hmm. know, kind of thing. But uh, like I, I myself like that kind of tactical, uh, and I encourage it in my games. But I, I just find that if you, if you offer logical consequences to actions, a lot of that can be dealt with quickly. It's basically rolling up a newspaper and backing him on the nose. With it. <laughs> One of the things that has always, uh, I've always liked writing down on my character sheets when I'm creating or leveling up a character are the cool little moves that you get, you know, like... You get the cool kick attack or you get the karate chop or now you've unlocked the power punch or the, you know, the, the, the Shatnerian double fisted <laughs> back smash. You've, you get to write these down because they're your skills start giving them to you as you level up, but no one ever uses them because who cares that my kick does 2d4 damage. I'm never going to kick a guy. I'm just going to shoot him with my trusty mm -hmm. pistol that does, you know, 1d6 times 100 damage <laughs> it's, yeah you can still do a lot with that though like um you know every 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 adventurer wants downtime and a character that's prone to do that is also prone to go looking for wenches and bars so to speak if you know what i mean mm -hmm. and Where are the how is how, how yeah how how is his uh resistance to uh intoxicants and and poisons mm-hmm Fuck, well, I mean, we wake up and all your shit just wasn't where you left it. And you got rolled, and motherfucker. You're naked in the field. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a good thing you have that, that power punch. Yeah. You know. yeah. The other tool is to have your NPCs do the off meta thing, as it were. Having your NPCs suddenly taking cover. Mm hmm. Uh, is mm -hmm. a great example of just a real bare bones basic one but we ran into a bunch of coalition dead boys but they all kept their rifles slung and were coming at us with vibro blades why the heck was that and um turns out it's because well if you look at your average coalition dead boy and you're in close quarters there's something to be said for dogpiling the glitter boy and starting to stick those yeah. blades through joints. <laughs> for a while, I had toyed with the idea of what I was calling a style bonus. And that was in combat, anytime you did something that you had not already done, you get an increasing plus one bonus to it. And it's cumulative. And that bonus stops and it resets the moment you do something that you've already done the moment you repeat an action in that combat so like you know if, if you're the guy who has 18 different attacks then you can start just cycling through them and then the moment you come back to something you've already done you've broken the style chain and it was inspired by like devil may cry where mm -hmm. that game or, or other video games like it, it encourage you to not just button mash the same thing you'll get more damage or more effect or more bonus if you start mixing things up into interesting combos you can also do scarcity mm -hmm. i mean i'm annoyingly a fan of ammo tracking ah but what if your number one spam attack is i'm one punch man yeah that's the that's the problem it's it, different pro, different manifestations of mm -hmm. the problem require different solutions yeah it's it's hard but um you also don't want to railroad the person like mm -hmm. if if that's all all they can show up for and they're just here to to play with friends and i've 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 done a couple like that but you kind of just want to leave them in the back and to do their thing you know i you can also challenge them to use the one punch in a different way like a classic problem in palladium and or palladium rifts is that you'll see a party with one or two like chalked out massive combat dealer characters and then a city rat a rogue scholar and a wilderness scout or the mm -hmm. incredibly squishy 
at times ley line walker. And uh, although boy, can they bring the fire when they need to, um, <laughs> the, the choices they make can sometimes be with that big hammer, but be used in ways that are creative. For instance, uh, one punch man hitting the center post in the barn. So the barn collapses around everybody else. So they have an opportunity to take out like 12 people instead of just one at a time, thereby saving the squishy friends in the party. You know, you, if you see those options where they are using the, the big hammer, but are using it in a creative fashion, I would argue you've actually kind of achieved it. And by rewarding it when they do do that, they'll also look for other novel ways to use their tools. How do you get them to do it in the first place? Um, you know, uh, oftentimes you got to show them a little bit like you're up against 12 opponents, you know, even in Palladium, very, very few of the big hammers are mass cash. Um, you can get maybe five, six at most, but if you've got a dozen dead boys, not all of them are going to be firing at the chrome guy. They're not going to be in position to, and if they are suddenly shooting at the rogue scholar, some of them are shooting at the rogue scholar or the ley line wizard, uh, because, oh, that guy's obviously magical. And one of the cornerstones of our ideological belief is he dies first. Um, or the DB uh, uh, off to the right, suddenly you may have the biggest gun in the room, but your biggest gun is only good for one or two people each round, and your friend's going to be dead before then, so you got to think creatively. And that's without, like, that's without, like, creating weird situations where you're in the mountain pass and your railgun's going to set off the avalanche, you know, that mm -hmm. the, the really constructed railroady type stuff. It's it's natural, it's organic, and you can still make it work. I like description. I, I always feel that when a character has a lot of information, when a player, excuse me, has a lot of information, they begin to think situationally and more than just, you know, this is what I do. For example, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's broken ground and they're coming at you from the east. It's like you're in rolling hills with, uh, with, with lots of broken rock and there's sand in the bottom where it's, where it's collected and uh, it's, it's built up behind these large pieces of jagged rock. Some stand quite high and some are like at the base where you can take cover in between them. They're approaching from, you know, air, land from the west and out of the sunset. Like, mm -hmm. Where are you standing? What are you doing? How are you going to meet this threat? And that will, that will get them starting to think about, about movement and, and lines of sight and, and things of that nature where they're not just, you know, a turret, basically. Mm -hmm. A corollary to that, though, is building the skills for yourself as a game master to be a yes and GM, mm -hmm. where when someone goes off the script and does something unexpected, figure out how to go yes and, like, you don't want to bend things super out of whack to make their crazy idea work, but if at all possible, the off-brand decision in a combat deserves the deserves yes and. the yes yeah. and and so it may not mm -hmm. be a me rules mechanical advantage but a situational advantage d is great like or just a spotlight advantage yeah. like somebody yeah. does something off the you know off script and you're like mm -hmm. oh i like that so much i'm going to narratively encourage this so like mm -hmm. shine more of a spotlight on that action make it sound more awesome make it uh, be more awesome make everybody be impressed by it yeah yeah one thing palladium is really good at is saying use what you want and don't use what you don't want and you have a lot of room for movement in palladium that you don't have in a lot of systems you can always make it an option and say hey you know you have the opportunity to move, you have the opportunity to do this, that, and the other. You have this many attacks per round. Just, you know, look at your hand-to-hand -hand or, you know, what your piloting skill is. Or you can save against the future. You can set. You can read the battlefield. Uh, you, you can bank that for a desperate burst 
um, basically like holding your action. Or you can take more movement because you're not stopping, you're not acquiring targets. You can take a moment to heave that log and duck down behind it as cover. You know, have some, like, don't, don't give them all times to build, like, little bases every round, mm -hmm. but give them the opportunity to, to mold their situation or mold their own position within that situation. Like, a gr great example would be fight breaks out, Glitter Boy flips a table in part to give the other people cover, but also give them a chance to run out the back door and circle the building. You mm -hmm. know, the things like that. Oftentimes, one of the big solutions to this problem is getting your players to think in as a small unit rather than a group of individuals. While I am a huge fan of the individual action spotlight moment, I oftentimes will go out of my way to reward a on the fly creative use of what amounts to small unit tactics. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the glitter boy choosing to use uh, some other weapon or even the big boom gun, but in a particular way. So it encourages people to seek cover. So the rest of the team can flank or something, you know, it's, it can be hard, especially with some of the one trick pony characters that Rifts mm -hmm. has to get them away from that without like really, really big narrative constructions. But even if they can start thinking about how to use it differently, they start opening up to, well, I also can do all this other stuff as well. And mm -hmm. that opens the door. Okay. Another thing to remember is, um, not a lot of people use missiles in, in rifts, <laughs> I mean. just, just, just because they don't. Uh, there's reasons for that. But a glitter boy, and in fact, most of your large mechs are a direct fire line of sight thing. And if you stand behind a hill and just lob you munitions over it, that glitter boy is done for. Eventually, depending on your supply of munitions and how many spotters you have out. I'm suddenly flashing back to the Discord conversation earlier today. What's that? <laughs> um, you know, oh, you got a small problem with the coalition? Well, I got these, uh, you know, MDC artillery pieces over here. <laughs> yeah. How many miles yeah, are away? Fire. <laughs> they, give some. Give Joe over here a radio up there, and uh, we'll we'll take care of those spider yeah. skull walkers. No problem for you. <laughs> Nothing Splash laughs up. like an artilleryman <laughs> against a bunch of units with direct fire weapons. <laughs> yeah. Come on, that's not cool, though. <laughs> What's cool is robots punching each other. <laughs> oh, you haven't seen cool until you've uh, been able to narrate a whole swath of Zentradi battle pods getting blown away because the forward observer f f made a good call. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no. Is there mortars anywhere? Uh, like outside I've of Recon? Them. Mortars? Yeah. Yeah, I think there, I've seen them. There are. Um, a lot I've of seen missiles. A lot of role-playing games don't deal with indirect fire capacities all that well. You know, an entrenched position, the Glitter Boy's boom gun might be able to batter it down, or that, you know, super strength power he's got in his armor can certainly mm -hmm. lob a grenade through a tiny slot real well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have very little experience with indirect fire in role-playing games simply because it tends to just not be as exciting on the whole. I mean, there are exceptions. I can understand that. But people sitting back and not taking direct part of a combat tends to make a combat feel a little dry. I've always found an intelligent enemy is way better than you in cover and stormtroopers just rushing down the corridor. I mean, they have the same cover you do, those veins sticking out. But yeah. no, they never use them. They just rush down the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I've... But nobody's telling a story about the last man at the gate when the enemy has indirect missiles. Yeah. I mean, uh, the big challenge <laughs> comes up to a lot of game masters have never really thought through what it's what it's like to describe that. Mm hmm you go back to platoon and are suddenly describing a napalm strike on the jungle behind you. And you can get a lot of mileage in the mental imagery you can evoke. Yeah. And having played a fair number of, uh, war themed games, the challenge of indirect fire, uh, air launched munitions, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, so disruptive influence comes with its whole, whole host of problems. But if you're in a game that isn't geared towards that, it can actually add a lot of fun flavor um, because the game isn't, uh, the, the players aren't mentally thinking about, oh my God, all we can see is that one guy on the hill with a bunch of binoculars and suddenly hell is raining down upon us. I would argue that that no longer becomes a matter of indirect fire. That simply becomes a matter of explosions in the background. You're no longer, because that, that is no longer an enemy. The enemy isn't the guy shooting him. The enemy is the spotter. Mm -hmm. So it's you versus the spotter. Right. The, the, the fire that's coming around you might as well be the weather. It's right. just an environmental effect that you're just describing in one way. But that's what I'm saying is wall. getting some players sitting around who are like, okay, we got, we got the action characters and action characters, and then we got two of them that are just like long range bomb droppers. And we're like, okay, well, we're basically playing two different games at this point. <laughs> we could oh, play, we could play the war strategy game and just push everything agreed, aside agreed. and play some battle tech or, or whatever, but but it, it can also be an effective tool when they're doing the same thing over and over again to have an enemy that learns. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So that when, when they just walk up and slaughter everything with their boom gun, the small child stumbling out of the ruin next door, holding their bleeding ears, will give them pause for thought. The enemy that is no longer standing there to be slaughtered, but pushing them under a barrage of munitions walking towards them will make them mm -hmm. change Stand, shoot, stand, shoot, stand, shoot. You may not want to do the little girl with the bleeding ears. I just, I, I'm, I'm a descriptive oh, storyteller. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm here for it. What do you want? <laughs> and then you flash forward 15 years where she's got and her she's own. back for vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you were the you were the uh, <laughs> glitter boy who yep. settled your minor dispute with a mm -hmm. DB in the middle of my village. I have come for revenge. <laughs> she, she herself <laughs> has become like a, a mm -hmm. lieutenant and officer in the coalition, mm -hmm. and is leading a an yeah, just, anti -GB just to force. remind them that uh, yeah. you know the the norms are about, and they don't have MDC protection. Right? They may have a so. Wilkes rifle if they're freaking lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also, like, we did just have the, the conversation about alignment, so let's, let's not do that. But I do believe that a, a knight errant strolling the land would take note of his surroundings. Yes. And if he is not doing, he or she is not doing that, perhaps it is time to remind them of their surroundings. I don't know if you've read the old Hackmaster, but the knight errant class was essentially a list of excuses why everything is killable. <laughs> I... <laughs> I love Hackmaster. I, I I have it right right okay. here. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the code of honor of the Knight Errant is one of the the greatest things ever written in all of role playing history. <laughs> well, uh, that's all I got. Also, if you want artillery rules for your Palladium game, check out Re Deluxe Recon. Ooh, yes, yeah. I'd be all about it in a Recon game. I'm oh yeah, it's, you gotta have it. It's right there on the page. Mm, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's on the cover. Cool. Well, folks, if you have advice, if you have tips on making, mixing up actions and combat, making it a bit more interesting for everybody and either with a light or heavy hand, convincing people to try different things, drop by our Discord and let us know your thoughts. We should do one on cover and concealment too. Like, uh, like the differences of like, mm -hmm. especially yes. when dealing with fucking MDC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I take cover behind the rocks. The, the what? The, the you, what? The, the gravel. You mean the gravel? You, you mean you the, the rapidly expanding cloud of shrapnel? You know? I, <laughs> do you have a rebreather yeah. on or what, how, what do you feel about silicosis? You know, I, it's, <laughs> I was spending most of my morning writing cover fire rules. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, suppressing nice. fire, <laughs> suppressing fire, pitting fire, covering fire, and cover. Trying to figure out how I think you should get a bonus if you shout suppressing fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, anyway, folks, stop by our Discord and say hi. We'd love to hear from you. No, have a good one. Catch you next time. Starships, magic, mystic martial arts, romance. All of these can be found in A Cloak of Blades by Isaac Sher. You might have heard my name before. I've done a lot of voiceover work for Breakfast Puppies. 
And I've recently released my first novel. It's available on Amazon as an ebook and paperback, and you can get it for free if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. I do hope you'll support my work as you're supporting Breakfast Puppies. And it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Have a good one. You've been listening to The Glitter Boys, a Palladium Books fan podcast. Glitter Boys, Rifts, the Megaverse, and all other such topics are the property of Kevin Sambita and Palladium Books. Please buy all their stuff and help keep them in print and making more games. You can order directly at palladiumbooks.com, and their entire catalog is available digitally at DriveThruRPG as well. Our opening music is 8-Bit Bass and Lead by Furby Guy from freesound.org. This closing music is Caravana by Philip Gross, available at freemusicarchive.org. All sound effects used are self-made or acquired via Creative Commons Zero License. If you like what you have heard, find us on Twitter and Facebook as The Glitter Boys. That's B-O-I-S. And check us out online at breakfastpuppies.com slash glitterboys. And also join us on the Breakfast Puppies Network Discord at breakfastpuppies.com slash discord. And if you want to help us out, please spread the word and help us build a community. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time.